Up until now, in our examples, we obtained an instance of a class that implemented iObservability using the range method. This meant we didn't have to create a class that implements iObservability ourselves. We used an inbuilt method written by the Rx team. This is also the preferred way of obtaining an iObservability. Almost always, we never need to write a class ourselves that implements iObservability. But only for the sake of completeness, I want to show you that you can write an implementation of iObservability and use it. And that's one of the use cases of using observables. In this example, we'll create a class that mimics the range method we used earlier. That is, we'll write a class that implements iObservable of int, and it'll take in a start and a count, and pop back at its observers a count number of integers from the start. Let's call it my range observable. In its constructor, we'll accept the start and count arguments and store them in private fields. The only thing left now is to write the subscribe method. In this method, we receive an observer to which we're supposed to pass back each of the values between the range. How do we do that? Well, that should be easy. We should simply run a for loop inside, and for every number in the loop, we call the onNext method on the observer. And when we're complete, we can send in an onComplete notification to the observer by calling the onComplete method. In fact, we need to cater for exceptions as well, so let's just put all of this in a try-catch block, and if you get an exception during the running of the for loop, or during the running of our method, we'll just propagate that exception to the observer by calling its onError method. Oh wait, but we need to return something that implements iDisposable. That'll represent the subscription. Now in this implementation, we don't have anything worth disposing that we can return to the client. So let's just create a simple class that implements iDisposable and does nothing else, and we'll just return that to the clients. And that seems about it. Now to use this observable, let's create an instance of it. And to its subscribe method, we need to pass in an iObserver of int. Now we can use any of the methods we've learned so far to create an observer. But in order to demonstrate the hazards of creating an iObservable of t implementation ourselves, I'm going to create a custom iObserver of int from scratch and pass that in here. That should be straightforward. We've already done this earlier. I'll just create a class that implements iObserver of int. And I'll just implement these three methods that write to the console. We'll pass that observer in here. And that looks like all that there is to it. Let's run this code. And it works just fine. So what could be wrong with implementing an iObservable of TR cells? It seems pretty straightforward and easy. Well, loads, loads. Let's analyze. For one, every iObservable of T must abide by a certain contract that it will produce zero or more values, that is, zero or more on next notifications, and then it'll terminate with either an on error or on completed notification. And that means there will be no more notifications and no more values after either an on error or on completed notification has been sent to the observers. Now, while our implementation does that, there is no inbuilt safeguard to ensure that that happens always. If I went and changed our code and added an on error notification before the for loop, the observer would receive the error and then all the values. And if I wanted to mess things around even a bit more, I could even go and add an on completed within the loop and issue as many complete notifications followed by a value each time. This is absurd. And you see, there are no safeguards. When we implement our observability, we must ensure that we adhere to this contract. Our implementation does nothing of the sort. Now, in this example so far, we've created everything by hand. A custom I observable, a custom I disposable to return from the subscribe method, and a custom I observer that we passed to the subscribe method. And because everything was our own implementation, 
Rx didn't help us at all in adhering to this contract because we never got it involved at all. We can mitigate this contract violation by asking Rx to create the observer for us instead of implementing the I observer of the interface. When we ask Rx to create an observer, either by calling observer.create or by passing in the three lambdas to the subscribe method on the observable, Rx creates a safe observer for us that ensures that these three events on next, on error and on completed are never sent out of order and the contract is never violated. To illustrate this, let us create a method in the program class to use an observer that we obtain using the observer.create method instead of implementing our own iObserver of T. When we run this code, we see that we do not get any notification if an on error or on completed has been issued. And if we create another method in the program class to use our observable, and this time instead of calling observer.create, I'll simply create an implicit observer by passing in the three lambdas to the subscribe method of our observable implementation. When we do this, the overload of the subscribe method that we use creates a safe observer internally and then calls this overload that accepts just an observer. In this case too, Rx comes to rescue and makes sure that the contract is adhered to. But you see the pitfall of creating a custom I observable of E implementation? It doesn't stop here. There is so much more that can go wrong with our custom implementation. In our implementation, if the client code forgets to call the dispose method on the I disposable subscription that it received, our observable does nothing to save the day. In a real world application that were to use our clumsy implementation of I observable, we could cause memory leaks and take down the whole client application altogether. The observable implementations that come out of Rx methods all make sure that they dispose the subscription when the observable either completes normally or reports an exception and terminates. They do this even if the client code that gets the disposable subscription forgets to call dispose on it. To demonstrate this weakness, let us make a small change to our dispose method. In this method, we'll just print out to the console and to the output window in the debugger who called the dispose method. That way we should know if anyone called it at all, and if they did, who did? Was it the client code or something from within the observable class that took care of calling it? Next, I'm simply going to subscribe to this observable and not call the dispose method in the client code. When we run this code, we see that the dispose was never called. Neither the console window nor the output window reports the message that we wrote in the body of the dispose method. Another shortcoming of our iObservable implementation is that it is blocking, in that it issues all the on next and on completed or on error notifications and only then returns the subscription disposable. This almost renders the subscription useless, since by the time the client gets it, it has already received all the values and can do nothing else if the subscription would dispose it. What if the client wanted to dispose the subscription earlier, only when it got some of the values, but before it received all the values and before the observable completed? We have no provision for such a behavior in our erratic implementation. Also, if a second observer were to subscribe to this immediately after the first one subscribes, the second observer would have to wait and would not even start to receive any notifications until the first observer had received all of them. Let's demo that. To illustrate, I'm going to make two subscriptions to our observable and we'll see when we run this code that they both serially get the notifications. The first one gets all the notifications and then the second one gets them all. And by the time they receive the subscription object, which is a disposable, they've already received all the values in the observable. This is not a behavior that we expect from observables. 
Okay, you might think that we can get around the blocking behavior by running the on next notifications or the whole of the subscribe method on a separate thread. But if we introduce concurrency in our observable, we would be imposing it on all the observers without any consideration to the peculiar needs of each observer or the client environment they are in. But anyway, for demonstration purposes, let's make our observable concurrent and we'll see the problem with that. If I scheduled this for loop to run on a separate task pool thread, I would not only be imposing concurrency, I would actually be offloading CPU bound work, in this case, on a separate thread, thus negatively affecting scalability of the client using this observable. For CPU bound work, the best practices for asynchronous programming dictate that we leave it upon the client code to decide how they would like to run the work. We mustn't impose concurrency. Not only that, Two observers using this observable could potentially outrace each other, meaning if one of the observers was slower than the other, the observable would probably not consistently propagate values to both of them. There might be a chance that the faster observer might see all the values, while the slower one may see a few, if any at all. Let's illustrate that. I'm going to create two observers here. The first one is a normal one that we had earlier. And then I'm going to create another observer, which is a slow observer. I'll call it a slow observer of t. And in every on next method, to slow it down, I'm going to make the current thread sleep for one second. And then there is one other difference in the observable implementation we're going to make. I'm going to move the current variable from being a local variable of the subscribe method to being a private field of our observable class, just to make it thread unsafe. Then, I'm going to set off two subscribers to subscribe to this observable, one after the other, and we'll run this code to watch what happens. As you notice, the second observer, which was the normal observer, received all the values from 5 to 12, whereas the first observer, which was the slow one, only received one of them, and in the meantime, the observable issued a non-completed notification. This also is inconsistent with how we expect an observable to behave. If all of this isn't enough ammunition to convince you of how hard it is to write a correct implementation of iObservable of T yourself, and that we almost should never do it unless we're implementing a library and we know what we're doing, let's take a look at another one of the drawbacks of our implementation. Another problem is that our implementation pays no regard to whether or not the client has disposed of the subscription. An erratic observable like ours can still continue to keep sending the observer notifications even after the observer has disposed of the subscription. To illustrate this point, let me put a thread dot sleep here for one second before each value is produced just to slow down the on next notifications. And in the client code, we'll unsubscribe from this observable immediately after subscribing. But when we run this code, we see that the observer still keeps receiving values even after it has disposed of its subscription, letting our observable know that it is no longer interested in receiving any more notifications. This is because of two reasons. First of all, our disposable that we return doesn't even represent anything remotely to do with the subscription and as such has no significance. But that's not the culprit. But the real culprit is, within the iObservable of the implementation that we wrote, we do not enforce any discipline to ensure that we do not propagate values to subscriptions that have been disposed of. When we use the Rx methods though, instead of implementing our own iObservable, Rx takes care of not sending notifications to disposed subscriptions. While we've seen in this video how we can implement an iObservable of T, and we may do that if you're designing libraries, I hope I've been able to convince you that it isn't such a good idea to do so. The preferred way is always to use the operators, that is, one or more of the methods provided by Rx on the iObservable of T that return to us a ready-made iObservable.